it's project car time and uh, I've got another one. <laughs> this is an introduction video to this, the Honda Insight. Now, it's a car that fascinates me from an engineering point of view, but also from a wonderful driving experience point of view. Um, I've actually owned this car twice. I bought this car in 2010 and I sold it to Honda of all people. And I've, to cut a long story short, I've bought it back and it needs resurrecting. So this video is gonna tell you all about why I like it, the history behind the car and what this particular version needs to get it back on the road. I'm Johnny Smith, welcome to The Late Break Show. I've really missed my Honda Insight ever since I sold it. I've got the opportunity, I had the opportunity to kind of buy it back from Honda because I sold it to Honda Heritage and they don't really need it anymore and I couldn't bear seeing it sitting and it was just sitting outside for several years doing nothing. But today I'm going to have it back because it's just arrived outside my house. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen this. In fact, a really long time since I've seen it. I'm really excited to have this car back because it, it, I don't know, it's, I'm just fascinated by it, but it's also a gorgeous little thing to drive. Okay, so before we delve into this particular car, why is the Insight so significant? For me, I love this thing for uh, many reasons. Let's start with September 1999. This was the world's first mass-produced hybrid car. Hybrids now in 2022, commonplace. They were pretty common 10 years ago. This came out in 99. Honda decided to do what Honda does best, and when it goes fanatical, it really goes for it. This is an all aluminium, super lightweight vehicle. I think it's about 830 kilos, and that includes obviously having a hybrid battery pack, which lives in there, which is why it's two-seater only. At the front there, you've got a three-cylinder 995cc VTEC lean burn, ultra light little engine, front wheel drive. And the combination of that hybrid battery pack there with nickel metal hydride um, cells, 144 volts, uh, little brushless motor, and that engine, this thing was capable of under 80 grams per kilometer and over 80 miles per gallon, which at the time was unheard of. <music> So Honda went for it with the Insight and actually a very, very odd car seldom seen on the road. In the UK, they only sold 250 of these officially. There are some Japanese imports, but this is one of the UK cars. In fact, this is an X demonstrator. You can tell that in certain lights, there's uh, remnants of decals on the bonnet, which says the world's first hybrid, amazing MPG or something, which is pretty cool. The other thing I love about this is not just an eco car, it actually drives really well. Amazing steering, fantastic gearing to enable it to slip through the air. It has a coefficient of like 0.25, really mad. The next thing is, why am I attracted to this car, this particular car? Why do I have a relationship with it? Well, this car is extremely high mileage. I bought this off an ex-employee of Honda and I went through the history and I realised it had been supplied new in Taunton in Somerset which is where I'm from. And I love that, it's got a stack of service history. So I bought it at 275K miles. I actually took a video of it passing 300,000. And the idea was, the attraction for me was using it as much as possible. When I realized I had to sell it because I was doing the school run more and I've got two kids, that became a problem. In fact, that was probably this car's main problem, which is why it lost out ultimately to Toyota's Prius. You see, the Prius came out as a five-seater, uh, normal looking blocky bar of soap looking thing actually. So think of this as the sort of VHS versus the Betamax Wars. If you're a bit older, you'll remember that. Which one ultimately won? VHS won. Was it better? Not necessarily, it just won. 
this was the Betamax. The Prius came out and everyone remembers the Toyota Prius. They don't really remember the Insight so much, but this in terms of a piece of engineering and build quality is just superb. This was built along the production line at the same time as the NSX. And we all know how famous, how hallowed, how revered the NSX is now. All aluminium, hand built, tons of incredible engineering. So this car, when I knew I was gonna sell it, Honda offered to buy it for their heritage fleet because it was high mileage and it proved how reliable and robust the little Insight was. Fast forward to 2021, 2022, I found out they didn't really do much with it because they'd bought a really low mileage example. And this poor thing was left out uh, to do nothing, frankly. So now my challenge is, I wanna get this roadworthy again to be able to use it regularly, uh, because ever since I did a feature on fifth gear on, on TV years ago about recession resistant cars, this was one of my choices. And this was the actual car that I drove on the TV show. So what do I need to do? In this episode, I'm hoping to get an MOT on it. And you'll see I've filmed this over the course of about a week as a bit of a video diary because my time is really short uh, and I never know how much time I'm going to spend on it on each day. So I jump on it. Hopefully I'll film a bit of my progress. But I've got to try and resurrect the battery pack, which is was replaced about 10 years ago. And we're hoping we can revive it from lack of use. I've got to service and check the engine. Uh, the brakes are seized at the rear from having a handbrake left on it. And I'm gonna put new front brakes on and check the braking system anyway. No rust to worry about as such, because it's all aluminium, but there are some weird earthing corrosion issues where steel meets aluminium. It's apparently called citrus yellow, even though I'm colorblind and it's, it's mocking me. This is clearly green, citrus metallic. I love this color. It, it reeks of the future. Uh, but yeah, the, a couple of differences were done uh, on the car uh, modified by the previous owner. S2000 leather steering wheel, because the original steering wheel is a bit plasticky. Um, I replaced the LCD dash display, which is really, really spacey. I love that, because uh, it was getting a bit pixelated and murky. Uh, and there's a couple of little bits I want to do, like an audio upgrade on it, maybe Bluetooth hands-free, stuff like that. Because it's an aluminium bodied car, it doesn't rot, but insights do have this weird scabbing that occurs and it's mostly only on the bottoms of the doors and it's happened on both of these doors. But I think although the paint's got some, it's got some abrasion in places, there aren't any major dents at all. Uh, the paint's weathered quite well and it's got no accident damage, which is great because aluminium body, it's a little bit uh, difficult to repair. It's exciting because my kids were really young when I had this and they referred to it as the green spaceship. And when they found out that I was buying it back, they were like, yeah, the spaceship is back. And now my kids go to different schools. So I typically do the school run at different times. So I should be okay to use this a little bit more. And I'm going to be using it on many shoots for the late break show because it's a perfect one person car, if you know what I mean. If you're wondering what that is, well, way before I was doing YouTube um, from 2012 time, 2013, 14, 15, I was building an electric dragster, an electric street legal drag car called the Flux Capacitor. And this was uh, the car I drove every day. And I used to regularly go to the drag track with it. So I was sort of promoting it really. I'll put a picture on screen of, of that car. But um, a lot of people are starting to convert these to full EV because of the lightweight and the slipperiness, mostly in the States. Um, but for the time being, I want to keep this as is. If I have to upgrade the batteries, I will, but I definitely want to do a grid charge upgrade, you know, a plug-in. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. This side worries me because we still haven't got that locking wheel nut off in order to access that wheel to see the condition out. But what I do know is that looking at the, the handbrake assembly inside, that side, the near side that Tim's working on, is the one that's been seized. So this side might be okay. And I'll work out how to professionally muller that off at a later date. Not, you know, not ideal, but needs must. It's been a bit of a swine to get um, the drums off. Um, but I have got rid of um, the aluminium drum to just look at the brakes and why they're binding. Because what happened was this got parked for about three and a half years outside under a tree with a handbrake on. And I think the handbrake had seized the shoes. 
But on closer inspection, it looks like the shoes are actually okay and the wheel cylinders are. So I've ordered some anyway, but we'll see. We should be able to uh, salvage these and clean up all underneath here. And I've got a couple of upgrades I'm hoping to do. The handbrake cable is seized, solid. Um, but the cable is free all the way down to where it goes into the back of the drum assembly. Yeah. Um, there's an aluminium sort of sleeve area, and I think which goes through a steel tube. And I think the two of it's caused corrosion in the aluminium, and I think which has sort of crushed the cable in the middle, so it sees solid. What I've found with this car is because it's all aluminium, apart from a couple of steel pieces, brackets, it's where those two marry, you get that weird corrosion, that fuzz. Like yeah, on, like, like on the drum. Like on the inside of the drum was ridiculously yeah. corroded, where yeah. it goes onto the face of the, yeah. of the hub. That's right. Um, and yeah, and that's why this piece of aluminium sleeve inside this piece of steel go. tube. Yeah, I think you've got that there. Got it. There. And it's just all corroded. And I think I say it's kind of almost crushed the cable in the middle. So it just will not go either way. Back inside the car here, we've, we've drowned it. We've drowned it in uh, penetrating oil. But you can see, can you see this? Obviously this side is the side that's the problem, this cable. And it does not move nearly as much as the other side does. Which is irritating because I'm, I'm going to find out in a second if the handbrake cable is bespoke to the inside. I mean, the good news is the shoes and the cylinder's good. The drum is reusable and that is inside only aluminium. Um, nice that's okay actually, isn't it? A yeah. bit of wire wool sorted that. As Tim's been doing that, I've actually been phoning up um, parts manufacturers and Honda. It seems Honda haven't answered yet. But it seems the handbrake cables are bespoke to the inside and you can't get them. Which makes me slightly nervous. Can't believe I've spent so much time on the handbrake cable. Did not think that this would be the longest problem so far. I've managed to find and get delivered in record time a handbrake cable for the near side rear. So hopefully me and Tim can fit that and that will sort the brake problem. Then we just bleed the brakes and change the fluid for good measure, they're done then. The service book, and you can see, this car was bought by two people who had really long commutes. And they obviously wanted to be very fuel efficient, but it was serviced on the dot. And it, it go, this goes all the way up to what, 246, 255, 269,000 there. I bought the car at 275,000. It's now showing 319,000 or 320,000. So it's a car that I sort of, I think one of the, the draws for it is that it's such a mad mileage vehicle, but yet it's so resilient. It proves the reliability. It's such a well-made thing. And I love that about it. And I also like the color and the look. Those wheel spats are cool. We turn our attention to the front brakes. And the, uh, I actually think that, that I had those discs put on it right. probably ooh, 10 years ago. Right. I mean, I could hear them binding when driving off the transporter, but then it has been sat dormant for three or four, might even be more than that years. So naturally when it comes to brakes, uh, because the channel, uh, the playlist on the channel is proudly supported by EBC, um, uh, the, the burnout series, as you probably know, you can get a discount code on EBC brakes. So although the original discs, we could probably skim them and they'll be fine. They've not got much wear on them. They've been sat. So I've got some new EBC pads, new EBC discs. There we go. Look, same spec, OEM spec, vented. So they're going to go on and we'll bleed the system. I've already taken out all the boot liner and everything, but this is what the inside battery cover looks like. This underneath, this, these extrusions of aluminium and loads, dozens of bolts. That is the IMA, Integrated Motor Assist Hybrid System, or the battery pack at least. So what I've got to do is a, is a guru for Insight Gen 1s called Peter Perkins, really good guy. Yeah, he says the quality of the cells in these is, is so good you can often revive them. And like I said, this was replaced by Honda 
uh, I think it was 10 years, nine, 10 years ago. So we're hoping uh, that we can bring it back and then I don't have to buy one. And if I do have to buy one, I'm gonna probably upgrade it to a lithium ion pack, which people are doing now, especially in the States where they sold a lot more of these. In here is the on off switch, the master switch of the hybrid system. So you turn it off by lifting out There's like a, a little sleeve which stops it from getting accidentally flipped. Flip that off. That means the pack is now dead as it were, but you still have to wear really thick gloves, rubber gloves, for insulation. So I think finally I've pulled out all of the, undone all of the bolts. There's loads. Rubber gloves on. Now, hopefully I'll be able to access the battery pack. <sighs> Nearly. <sighs> okay. Behold, the heart, the electric heart of the Insight so this is the battery pack. It's got the cooling system there. Uh, I've never seen it before. I've seen pictures of when the battery pack was changed on this car uh, by Honda. It had a Honda battery pack. And like I said, apparently the nickel metal hydride uh, system is a very reliable, good quality cell system. Um, and I'm hoping we can resurrect this from sitting dormant uh, by following the instructions of the guru of the Gem One Insights, um, Peter Perkins. So let's see, I've got to find the, ma I found the master switch obviously, it won't go near it without removing that. And I've got to follow his tutorial where there's a couple of tabs that we can connect a very slow charger to and then cycle it, charge it, discharge it using very simple discharge method, a incandescent light bulb. Now as random as it looks, I'm gonna need a light bulb for this with a mains plug some covered crocodile clips and I'm going to need three little boxes which I've ordered on the instruction of Peter Perkins from the uh, the Insight Guru chap and these are, two of these are going to be linked together in order to charge the battery really slowly. Uh, these are up to 100 volts output and then this one is a smaller version I think yeah, smaller version here. And that's gonna be used apparently when the battery is being charged, that will run the cooling fan to keep the battery pack nice and happy temperature wise. And that is gonna be rigged up to the battery when it's charged to discharge it safely with a, a, you know, a big inefficient bulb, old school bulb. And then we're gonna do that maybe three times if we can, uh, maybe even longer. That is the principle for reviving this battery pack. Let's hope that it works. Anyway, we get to the end of another day. Uh, actually, before I go to bed, I'm hoping to hook up this battery pack and start this deep cycle, this slow deep cycle that's so crucial to kind of nursing it back to health. But I can't deny I'm a little bit stressed about getting it connected properly. Okay, so this is the stressful bit. Um, I've pre-wired these little devices, which are just very, very slow charge units onto a three pin plug. This one here goes to the fan, that fan there, and that will run the whole time that the battery is charging, not for the discharge. Uh, the pack is still off. I've got my thick gloves on gonna cover myself up well I've got to get my hand this is the bit that scares me I've got to get my hand down there to plug the positive lead onto a tab and I've actually been putting this off for some time because I don't really want to do it but there is no other way so, so I need to stop being silly and just do it okay Idiot. Come on, man, get a grip.
goodness sake, idiot. Okay, let's just have a bit of a recap then. You can hear the fan is going on the pack. The pack is on, and if you can see that down there, uh, there's various, the orange is obviously high voltage terminals. I've got my thick rubber gloves on. The positive lead is right down there. The negative is up here. My little strangely hashed up box of tricks is here. Those crocodile clips go to the fan. And I'm now going to leave this and shut the boot gently for in excess of 24 hours. There we go. Walk away. Walk away for 24 hours. It's been near as damn it 24 hours since I put the insight on charge. Um, and it looks like it's done something. There's some warmth coming out of the fan. Um, the packs have got a little bit warm. So I think there's been some charge action going on. So I'm gonna take that off charge shortly and I can start the discharge part of the cycle. That's good news. Bad news, I found a dead bee, bumblebee on the bonnet this morning, which is a shame. I love bumblebees and it's raining. So we're gonna get this without further ado in there and continue and start the discharge. Okay, bit of a, bit of a recap time. Ironically, it stopped raining within half an hour of me bringing the bloody car in. But anyway, um, I'm ringing up the discharger. So it's just a little bulb. I've put a 100 watt bulb in there, normal incandescent bulb on a cable attached to the crocodile clips connected to the battery pack as was thick rubber gloves on. And if I turn the hybrid uh, battery on, that should light and I leave that now for could be 24 hours. Obviously, the longer it stays lit, the better quality the battery was, the better state of charge it was. Let's see. Yeah. And now to wait. Battery pack is on, battery pack is charged. As you know, you saw when we got the car off the trailer, it does start and run, but battery pack, not so well. So let's see what happens. There's the battery status. Now, sometimes you have to let it settle down in order for the battery status to be kind of established. This is the loudest you'll ever hear it inside a garage with the bonnet up. Even when they're stone cold, they're surprisingly quiet. So the car usually needs a couple of minutes to establish contact with the battery to see whether or not it's charged or not. It's coming up. It is coming up. Ah, oh, so going to be 320,000 miles soon. Um, I'm off to the MOT station in half an hour or so. Let's see what happens. If it fails, it fails, but I'm pretty sure it will run and drive OK. It's still bits to do. Gosh, it's been a really long time, actually. So I can see the IMA assistance graph working. That means that the hybrid battery is working. I haven't actually put the cover on it yet because I still want to check that it's okay and I want to cycle it again really over the weekend. I'm running behind on all this because of the unforeseen seizures. So nip into the MOT station. I've got a hunch that it's not going to pass because the airbag light is on and I, I've just looked on the forum and it might be because that 
there's a bit of a water leak on that B pillar and it interferes with the sensor on the seat belt. So let's see. This is what happens when you leave a car. Still. This car hasn't been MOT'd since September 2015. And like I said, it's been parked outside pretty much under a bush um, with a handbrake on. But it's lovely to get back in it. This is the first time I've driven it. And, um, and I'm, I feel positive. But the drivetrain, the bit that I was really worried about, I think, is going to be okay. 319,634 miles so far. If you've never driven an Insight before, a first gen, it's one of those cars you ought to spend some time in before you die. Even if you don't care about hybridization or sheer economy, there's something about the way this car's engineered, there's something about the way the car steers, and that, that incredible lightness and unsprung weight. It's just a really, it's, it's good Honda. It's peak Honda almost, or peak Honda tech. One thing I forgot to say is uh, if you looked at my Beetle and you wonder what that's about and you've never seen it before, that's my first car. I'll put a link above for a video on how we resurrected that. Um, and of course, I'll put a link also at the end for a playlist for all my project cars. Anyway, I'm going to zip to the MOT station and I will let you know how it gets on. But this is the first episode of the Insight Project. This car's gonna stay with me now because I've missed it so much. And I really believe in resurrecting cars. I believe in the mend and make do mentality. This car still had lots of life left in it. It's just a case of if people are willing to spend some money on parts and time investigating all these ways to modify cars. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Late Break Show. Subscribe, let me know in the comments what do you want me to do with this thing next? Should I look at lithium iron hybridization battery. I'm going to change the suspension a little bit. I'm, I've ordered some dampers for the back. Um, uh, yeah, it's just nice to be back in it. <laughs> anyway, cheers.